Andre and uh, the Chicago branch for sponsoring these uh, Zoom sessions. And I think uh, this is obviously a very deep uh, subject, uh, so it's, it's impossible to be exhaustive. Uh, there are uh, various contributors uh, within the anthroposophical movement, within the Christian community, movement who have uh, written and made contributions towards a deeper understanding of uh, the apocalypse and the book of revelation including email Bach uh, among others uh, I'll uh, next time try to put together a few of those resources so that uh, those who'd like to pursue it further could explore those as well the uh, differentiation that I brought up last time uh, between what Rudolf Steiner shared in his very last lectures on the book of Revelation, which was just uh, a very short time before his last address uh, that was given on September 28th, uh, 1924. He had hoped to give a second part to that uh, presentation, but he was too ill uh, to uh, make it happen. And I think uh, there is some kind of a, a destiny uh, signature there uh, that he was talking about. Uh, the mystery of the two Johns, which he had otherwise only touched upon in the esoteric lessons. And uh, this has to do then with the raising of Lazarus, that uh, Lazarus has this background uh, with the Cain stream, having been Hiram Abiff in a former incarnation, a leading member of the Cain stream that collaborated with uh, King Solomon to build the temple of the Hebrews in Jerusalem and that uh, we know of how John the Baptist played such a central role in the preparation for the mystery of Golgotha. Uh, he was then the one who presided over the baptism as a representative of Yahweh, uh, the seventh Elohim who had remained behind when the other six departed uh, to the sun in the Hyperborean uh, period. And that uh, he was really preparing uh, through the Hebrew hereditary stream for that perfect vessel. You could call it the grail vessel uh, that could receive uh, the solar logos. And that then uh, eventually led to a later period when John the Baptist, as one hears about uh, the uh, birthday of King Herod and Solomon's dance kind of had this seductive influence and he was ready to give a gift. Uh, and uh, Salome went to her mother to ask her what she should ask for. And she is the one who then uh, Herodias suggested she demand the head of John the Baptist. And that uh, carrying of the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter is sort of a symbol of the anti-grail mysteries uh, that Herod was very much a part of. You have in this Herod lineage uh, the killing of the innocents to try to prevent uh, the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem as the prophets had foretold. So that this slaying of the children uh, by Herod is like a precursor to this image that 
hovers above us in our time in connection with what Rudolf Steiner indicated uh, in that priest cycle of the apocalypse where the seventh trumpet is now sounding since the turn of the millennium. And so overlighting us at this time is the image of the woman standing upon the moon crowned with the stars and clothed with the sun. And there's another then powerful part of that, which is the dragon, the red fiery dragon with seven heads and 10 horns that wants to devour the child. That's a metamorphosis of Herod slaying the children, you could say on a grand cosmic level that we have to face in our time. But the child was taken up onto the throne. But the woman uh, is then persecuted and the remnant of her seed. And here's how she goes into the wilderness. And the dragon sends out a flood after her to carry her away. But the earth takes up that flood. And she's given the wings of an eagle to, you could say, fly to a higher place in the astral world where that polluted stream of the dragon's flood can't reach her. And we know that John, the writer of the book of Revelation, uh, was referred to with the symbol of the eagle, which has to do with thinking uh, raised to a higher level. So this writer of the book of Revelation, according to Rudolf Steiner, uh, uh, which he hinted at in this last address, was that the soul of John the Baptist, who had kind of overlighted the disciples and uh, had a special relationship to John, the beloved Lazarus, who became John because he was, uh, in a sense, ready to die to himself. He was the rich young man who had to give up his treasures, not just on the physical plane, but on the inner plane. He had treasures he brought with him. So that there was then a communion brought about in this initiation between John the Baptist, whose parents had both been of the priestly stream, which is the Abel stream, has a more feminine connection that's related to the realm of grace, as opposed to the cane stream having to work with the sweat of the brow on the earth to work with the metals and the, uh, the agriculture, uh, the sun forces, as opposed to the moon forces. So here you have a transition from John the Baptist who was aligned to Yahweh to now aligning himself to the sun principle, to the Christ being. So that's just a sort of an introduction to uh, the theme. Let me uh, share the slides. So once again, we have the seven seals and we differentiated between these seven seals and the seven seals uh, that are related in the, uh, I believe it's the third and fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, where you have the book that's sealed with seven seals these seals relate to the entire uh, book of Revelation as opposed to those seals which are opened and by the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, and that then lead initially to the four horsemen and beyond. So there's many versions of the seals. Uh, these uh, were painted by Arild Rosenkrantz, 
a pupil of Rudolf Steiner. He consulted with Rudolf Steiner. And I wanted to remind that these are Rosicrucian seals in the first uh, presentation on this theme. I showed how these seals were there in the Malschbau, which Rudolf Steiner characterized as the first Rosicrucian temple on the earth. Previously, one had to meet a Rosicrucian initiate to find one's way into that temple, which was still on the astral plane. So there's various efforts to work with this theme. Uh, here is another set by our old Rosenkrantz uh, that are black and white. They were included in a large format book called The Seals and the Columns. As I mentioned in the past, the seals have to do with the world of imagination and the trumpets with the world of inspiration and the, the pillars which have to do with form uh, they relate to this realm of the music of the spheres uh, behind all material manifestation is the music of the spheres that reside in the lower and higher devakan uh, or lower and higher heavenly realm this is the mystery of the logos and the word which begin the gospel of saint john so i wanted to draw attention to the fact that peter the disciple and john have a, a different task uh, the disciple peter has more to do with exoteric christianity whereas the beloved disciple who wrote the gospel of john the book of revelation has more to do with laying the foundations for a more esoteric christianity which leads over to anthroposophy and at the very end of that book in the 21st chapter there's this scene i've written it here in the right margin of this slide. And then Peter turning about seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So he describes how this sort of spread abroad as though this disciple wouldn't uh, die until the second coming of Christ would occur. But it's really over a long period of time and many incarnations that this beloved disciple, which really involves these two individualities I spoke of, two separate streams form that flow into anthroposophy. And Rudolf Steiner uh, mentions in conversation to Riddlemeyer that Christian Rosenkreutz, who is the reincarnated Lazarus John, was one of his initiators. So that uh, this preparing for the second coming of Christ in the etheric that is really a mission of John and in our own time, Christian Rosenkreutz, but also the continuation of the incarnations of John the Baptist, which then are Raphael, the painter, 
and later Novalis, uh, the wise young sage in the European German Romantic movement. This kind of gives uh, a bit of a, an overview of the seven stages of Earth evolution, where we have at the far left uh, the recapitulation of old Saturn during the Polarian epoch. Each of these can be divided into seven ages. Then you have the Hyperborean, which is a recapitulation of the old sun. And then uh, the recapitulation of the old moon in the Lemurian period. So the first real earth stage is the Atlantean at the bottom there. And then we move on to the present age, this post-Atlantean age, uh, which is uh, addressed in the seven letters to the seven churches. And each of those periods of seven ages last 2,160 years which is one twelfth of a Platonic year, which involves a cycle of 25,920 years, which can be characterized as a fullness of time. Last time I spoke of 12 Easter's because the mystery of Golgotha took place in the age of Aries, where the image of the sacrificial lamb or the ram is in the foreground. And in our own time, own time, it's the Piscean age. So Easter's uh, at the vernal equinox occur when the sun is in the sign of Pisces. And in the next Slavic uh, Russian age, it'll be in the sign of Aquarius, which one could also call the Sophian age. So we have the seven letters relating to the present uh, ages, cycle of seven. And we're at the moment in the fifth of those, looking forward and preparing the sixth. But then there's the sixth great epoch, which is in the longer cycle that Rudolf Steiner uh, expressed in uh, 1908 in the Nuremberg cycle, you have that then uh, the seven seals during the six great epoch. And between those two is the war of all against all. And then in the final seven ages, you have the seventh trumpet in the seventh epoch of the earth. So it's important to live into the relationship between the human microcosm and the macrocosm. So in a simpler catechismal uh, sense, one hears that uh, man, man, woman is made in the image of God. And in the alchemical uh, text, they spoke of as above, so below. The human body is related to the macrocosm and its different organs can be related to the planetary spheres. For example, the heart can be related to the sun in our solar system and the head to the moon and the earth together. So here uh, is just a quote from Steiner where he draws attention to the fact that in the normal state, a man draws 18 breaths a minute. This varies because he breathes rather quicker in childhood and more slowly in old age. But uh, of a normal man, it is correct to say he draws 18 breaths a minute. It is easy to reckon that 18 times 60 makes 1,080, which is the number of breaths uh, to the hour. Multiply this by 24, the number of breaths in the day, and you get 
25,920 breaths in a day, which corresponds to the 25,920 years in the Platonic year. So here you see a kind of relationship between the human microcosm and the macrocosm. So that each of these years uh, in the great cosmic rhythm is like a macrocosmic in-breathing and out-breathing. This is to help us uh, to get a sense of how we're not recapitulating in our time, but anticipating the future prophetically. And this can help us to live into this apocalyptic time. In our age of civilization, the fifth, we have nothing to repeat. Let us bring this thought before our minds. We have nothing to repeat, no ancient remembrances. We have given birth to a man, a fifth age of civilization, one whose results will be seen in the future, while the four previous ages were repetitions of the four preceding cosmic epochs in our age, our age must give birth not merely to an ancient wisdom, but to a new wisdom, a wisdom which points not only to the past, but which must work prophetically, apocalyptically into the future. In the mysteries of past ages of civilization, we see an ancient wisdom preserved, but our wisdom must be an apocalyptic wisdom the seed for which must be sown by us. Once again, we have need of a principle of initiation so that the primeval connection with spiritual worlds may be renewed. The task of anthroposophical movement is to supply this principle. So, and in this little paragraph below, which is taken from the priest cycle, which is then having to do with uh, a consciousness soul interpretation of the book of Revelation for our time. I believe this is in the 13th lecture of that series of 18. He says, the fifth angel began to sound his trumpet at the beginning of the 1840s. And he will continue to sound it until the end of the 20th century when the trumpet of the seventh angel will begin to sound. In the realm of the consciousness soul as civilized human beings, we are in the second woe. So he's speaking back then, before the turn of the millennium, we are now actually in the third woe. So the three woes are particularly intense apocalyptic times and uh, the tenth chapter in the book of Revelation is related to this sixth angel sounding where humanity collectively crosses the threshold and there is actually a dividing of the spirits. And I shared content where Steiner indicated that there's this tragic experience that he shared where behind the scenes of our earthly life, uh, there is a dividing of souls, some rising upward to a new connection to the spiritual world and others descending into the lower worlds. And that they actually either raise their angel up with them or they drag their angel down with them. So this is part of the tragedy, uh, tragedy behind the scenes of our present earthly period. And Rudolf Steiner spoke on numerous occasions, especially during the karma cycles, uh, during uh, this last period, 1924. I have said that those who stand with full intensity within the anthroposophical movement will return at the end of the century and others will then unite with them. For by this means, the salvation of the earth and earthly civilization from destruction must eventually be settled. This is the mission of the anthroposophical movement, which weighs on the one hand so heavily upon one's heart. 
while on the other hand it moves the heart, uplifts it with enthusiasm. This mission we must understand and see. So this is the battle he had often spoke of that we're really facing in our time where the long prepared joining of the Aristotelians who gathered around Rudolf Steiner, who had been Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, uh, to the Platonists who gathered uh, in the period of Chartres, for example. Uh, anyway, these are these two currents uh, that are meant to come together uh, to participate in this great battle. Now, I wanted to draw attention to a significant event in the past uh, that occurred around the middle of the Lemurian epoch, uh, that there was a kind of crisis that was occurring uh, due to the fact that the sun had departed in the Hyperborean age where a human being received the gift of their etheric body. And now during this period, the gift of the astral body was being bestowed through the spirits of movement, dunamis. And that uh, there was a hardening of the physical bodies, which were still in a very subtle state that hadn't really descended fully onto the earth. The earth was more fiery and fluid in as much as it had begun to become physical. And that only the strongest of souls could maintain a connection to the earth. Others were then prompted to migrate to the other planetary spheres which had separated from the sun earlier. And that uh, this is uh, related to the story of Adam and Eve. You could say they were the strongest who could then remain connected with the earth during this Lemurian crisis. And in order to prevent this from from extinguishing the connection of humanity to the earth, the seventh Elohim, which is really the Lord of form, took the densest substances of the earth out of the earth so that it then formed the satellite, which has in the meantime become the present moon which is, you could say, the citadel of Ariman. And Rudolf Steiner describes how this moon has a special task of preventing what the Luciferic beings who sought to lift human beings out of the physical, they didn't want human beings to descend down into the dense physical world so Yahweh implanted in the lower unconscious nature of the human being what later emerged as human sexuality, the procreative capacity from an androgynous state where the feminine was in the foreground to the division of the sexes. So the division of the sexes occurred in concert with this uh, moon exit from the earth. And this happened in the Pacific region of the earth and left behind a wound that is in our time the ring of fire where about 90% of volcanism on the earth occurs. These are the most powerful earth energies released from the interior of the earth which are the hell regions of the earth. The Rosicrucians spoke of nine layers of the earth. And the black magicians strive towards the center of the earth. But the Christ 
in his first coming penetrated into those regions and really established his throne at the center of the earth. So there's a battle at the center of the earth for the future of the earth. And you could say Yahweh, this Lord of form, works especially through the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland uh, governs form, whether uh, the form is balanced between dwarfism and giantism. This is a lunar organ. And we have the pineal gland, which I believe I touched on in an earlier presentation, which is a sun organ, a solar organ. It's the metamorphos of our heart in our past incarnation. And that it can begin to shine. Steiner speaks of this in the etherization of the blood. That's really related to the earth shining from its center as well since the mystery of Golgotha, where Christ became the planetary spirit. So we're not really treating the moon in a sacred manner anymore. We want to colonize the moon and create a moon basis and from there on to Mars, etc. This is really a uh, product of the scientific worldview which denies the spirit and uh, has a very strong Arimanic double and that uh, Ariman denies the spirit. And so science fiction has arisen out of this scientific mindset, which is a deviant road for the imaginative consciousness. But many human beings have become captured by that power and fascination that Hollywood helps to propagate through Star Wars and Star Trek and all these other films. In this slide in the top left is a sketch uh, by Rudolf Steiner in pastel on paper. And it relates to Yahweh, Moon, and the Luciferic temptation. After the first, after first the sun had emerged from the earth in the Hyperborean time, and later the moon in the Lemurian time, Yahweh, one of the seven sun Elohim, but who had now united with the moon and worked from there, wanted to give men a consciousness through which he could reflect the wise design of the world in himself, completely unadulterated. Then the Luciferic beings intervened in the development. They had already become adversaries of the sun spirits on the old moon. They could not go along with the sun when it separated from the earth. And they also had to regard Yahweh as an adversary. The Luciferic hopes, hosts now made the human astral body more independent than the Elohim had intended. The human consciousness thus no longer remained a mere mirror of the cosmic wisdom, but the human being got the possibility from his astral body to regulate and control the images of consciousness. However, the human eye thereby also became much more entangled in the activity of the astral body and more and more dependent on it. Thus, the Luciferic spirits enabled man to develop free activity in consciousness, but with it also the possibility of error and evil. Man had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So here uh, Steiner speaks of the various adversarial beings. The Azuric beings remain behind on old Saturn, satanic fire spirits on old sun. The regent of fire spirits is Christ. Luciferic spirits fell behind on old moon. Lucifer was at work in the Lemurian epoch, could be included in earth evolution and worked as a liberator by giving men independence and enthusiasm for wisdom. So there's a benefit from these Luciferic beings. 
satanic gods of hindrance began their work in the Atlantean epoch. Azuras are starting to work in the post-Atlantean epoch, in our own age. They're the worst of the three, and they mainly work into sexual life in the physical body. And many sexual aberrations today are to be ascribed to this strong influx. All forces of hindrance try to hold on to currently existing things that are still, still imperfect, carry them out and intensify them. Lucifer gave independence, egoity with egoism. Egoism, error, and animal love are the first expressions of egoity, wisdom, and highest spiritual love. We must bring about the respective transformations. The separation of the sexes took place in the third root race. It'll be overcome in the sixth root race. This must be prepared for in the sixth sub race. So the sixth root race is the time of the sea, seven seals as described in Steiner's 1908 apocalypse interpretation. And uh, that begins with the war of all against all. But the preparation for this uh, that he's talking about is the sixth sub-race, that's the sixth cultural epoch, which is the one after ours here, the Philadelphia age, the Aquarian age that I've touched on on several occasions. That is the ripest fruit of our seven ages, each lasting 2,160 years. It will be the ripe fruit that carries over into the sixth great epoch, the time of the seals after the war of all against all. And this is a, a powerful transition because currently our bodies are the subject of heredity. They reflect the blood line that goes back to our forebears. But after this war of all against all, our physical bodies, in as much as we have them on the earthly plane, will be the result of our inner moral life. The outer bodies will be a manifestation of our inner being, our moral or immoral development. So there will be a good and an evil race, although the higher one can't really call it a race anymore in the old sense where blood relationships were concerned. So egoism, error, and animal love are the first expression of egoity, wisdom, and highest spiritual love. We must bring about the respective transformation. The separation of the sexes took place in the third root race. It'll be overcome in the sixth root race. This must be prepared for in the sixth sub race man's productive forces are becoming transformed. The productive force as such is the most sacred thing that we have because it's directly divine. The more divine what we pull into the dirt is the greatest, is the greater the sin. Later on the heart and larynx will be the productive organs in us. Just as the word became flesh in Christ Jesus, so the flesh must become word when Christendom becomes perfected. That's the mystery of the Holy Grail, the Holy Love Lance, the fertilizing sunlight that'll unite with Eva again. This is a, another window in the chapel at Kahumana. Virginia Brett, who was both a speech teacher and had was a eurythmist and a curative eurythmist who lived at Kahumana during her later years and kind of passed uh, across the threshold in our house. And uh, she had two rooms there on the one end of our house and she put 
uh, on the door of the one that she was in when she first moved in from her other quarters, which involved a flight of stairs where she had a speech room. And uh, she had the alpha symbol on that and the other door to the other room. The omega symbol. And when she knew that her time was coming, she moved from the one room to the other. And contacted certain close friends so that she could say her goodbyes. This is from an uh, alchemical text called the uh, Rosarium Philosophorum. Uh, it kind of depicts how uh, this androgynous uh, state of the past has to be renewed on a higher level. It's a little bit of uh, Goethe's dying and becoming, uh, that we have to prepare for a time where we won't any longer be able to incarnate on the physical plane. And the Christ is what makes it possible to undergo this metamorphosis that Rudolf Steiner spoke of in the uh, text from the esoteric lesson that I spoke of before. That esoteric lesson was much more elaborate. The pupils who were there were not allowed to take notes. They had to write them down after they got home if they chose to, and often for the publication, which only came out much later, uh, they often uh, sort of looked at various versions of participants. So the first half of Earth evolution is uh, governed by the Mars forces, and the iron in our blood is related to that incarnational process that was in the aftermath of the division of the sexes that made it possible for human beings to incarnate on the earth. It didn't really fully come to expression until the next uh, Atlantean period when the mineral kingdom was added and that uh, human beings began to resemble more and more the physiognomy we carry with us in this post-Atlantean period. But the second half of Earth evolution has to do with uh, the Mercury influence, and the symbol of those Mercury influences is the caduceus, which is often uh, the staff of Asclepius, the healing uh, staff. And Rudolf Steiner gave a kind of meditation of saying, you can imagine one of these serpents as being a dark serpent representing the night consciousness, the other, the light shining serpent representing the day consciousness. And that it's by weaving the two together and rising to the spirit that we awaken the higher self. So uh, imaginative consciousness begin to arise out of dream consciousness. We're always dreaming in our hearts and rhythmic system. And so this whole impulse of the mercurial forces have to do with this rhythmic system. The rhythmic system has to do with the etheric body, which is the healer within the body. It's also called the love body. And so uh, you have then the moon forces below. The thinking forces have to become subservient to the sun forces, these fire forces. 
And through this, we can raise uh, thinking to imagination, to inspiration, and eventually to intuition, a kind of communion with the higher uh, beings. So Rudolf Steiner took up this theme somewhat, borrowed it to a certain extent from Goethe's fairy tale, which was also the inspiration for his mystery plays initially. So during Steiner's later years, uh, he worked intensively, actually starting from the age of 21, when he received a copy of this from uh, his uh, mentor, uh, Schrerer. So in Schrerer, one can see an incarnation of the Plato soul, the teacher of Goethe. And Goethe described how when he was in the room with Schrerer, there was another being who was present. And that was the departed soul of Goethe himself. So Rudolf Steiner once spoke of how when we're in earthly incarnation, we often are able to manifest only one seventh of what we really have to offer. And a soul who can build a bridge to the departed soul, one like Goethe, who's had such a ripe soul spiritual uh, life, uh, one could gather in those other six sevenths. And you can be sure Rudolf Steiner worked in that direction, spent something like 14 years uh, working on editing Goethe's scientific work. And so here you have a kind of love of the Johannes uh, soul, who's kind of this melancholy human soul, uh, who then reaches across after getting to the other side of the river or the stream and then reaching out to the lily soul, the higher soul who has three helpers. And he then uh, kind of dies to himself. He undergoes a kind of death. This is the way that love is metamorphosed. Certain human beings prepare this. And you could see this in the life of Novalis, for example, who's one of those who's preparing the sixth age that lies ahead of us, where as Steiner indicated in that uh, esoteric lesson, the future sixth epoch has to be prepared in the sixth age. And one of those preparations is to overcome propagation on the physical plane and develop a new level of uh, connecting with the earth. And so, in this Goethe's fairy tale, there is an exchange between the man with the lamp. What is more precious than gold, inquired the king. Light, replied the snake. What is more refreshing than light, said he. Conversation, answered she. So conversation can be raised to the level of the word. And there are organs that will disappear in the future from our physical nature, which includes the generative organs and the heart and the larynx will take on an ever more important development that represents our future. So conversation is the beginning of the development of the grail sword. You hear in the Parsival, it's when Parsival uh, first entered the grail castle he didn't ask the question, what ails thee? There wasn't compassion in his voice, in his word. So he was repulsed and had to go back to his path of learning, 
But later he came back and was ready to answer the question or ask the question of Amfortas, the wounded fisher king, and that brought about a healing. And we know that Amfortas had fallen prey to the lower love, the selfish love. So that's an important theme that carries over into the apocalypse. Now, part of what inspired Goethe to write the Goethe's fairy tale was his reading and contemplating of the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. And Rudolf Steiner tells us that this is an initiation that's described there. Valentin Andre, as a young man, wrote it down. And that uh, this involved an initiation of Christian Rosenkreutz by Mani Mainz. I've spoken about the importance of Mainz as a future leader of the transformation of evil. And there's a scene in there where uh, you have up above, you have a kind of scientific kind of parlor where there's instruments and all of that. But later he finds his way down into a lower level and he enters a kind of cavernous room. And there he beholds the naked, Venus lying on a bed. And while he's caught up with that image, Cupid, who's the mischievous uh, little angelic presence who often is shown with his bow and arrow, he pricks Christian Rosenkreutz. And later in that Rosicrucian story, you hear that because of that, he has to take over the position of the guardian of these mysteries. When he first came, he met this guardian. He had to bring his invitation and show him that he was invited as a guest to this chemical wedding. But now he has to take the place of that guardian, which is to say that Christian Rosenkreutz himself becomes the new guardian of these mysteries that involve the transformation of these Venus forces, these Eros forces, into higher forms of love. And this is also comes through in the forging of the Grail Sword, which one can characterize as the micro logos. In past lectures, I've pointed out that the a grail story by Wolfram von Eschenbach is divided into 16 chapters. And at the very beginning of the book, there is this battle. And there is a castle uh, where this dark uh, queen, uh, Belacane, lives. And she's a widow. And there's two armies. One is the white army led by Frieda Brunt, which has to do with the word freedom. And on the other, you have the black army, which remembers this former initiate king who had a, a helmet that was forged from diamonds. So the higher world still shone in. That's the old mystery wisdom that they were looking back to. And so this is really related to the throat chakra that has 16 petals. And eight of them are there from the past. So you need eight to re-enliven this organ for the future. And this is the Eightfold Path of Buddha, which is carried over into anthroposophy as an important preparatory work on the meditative path. So the mystery of the word has an integral contribution to make towards the emergence of future androgyny that needs to be consciously prepared as part of the long overdue shift from the Mars mysteries that were the 
in the foreground in the first half of Earth evolution to the Mercury mystery symbolized by the mercurial staff, the caduceus, that will heal the polarization associated with the division of the sexes that has occurred in the wake of the fall. As you know, the forging of the word sword that can be characterized as the micrologos is, this, is central to the quest for the Holy Grail. The first Goetheanum, also described as the house of the word, can be seen as a modern day grail sanctuary, was meant to be a visible manifestation of anthroposophy in the sense that spiritual science is a science of the Holy Grail. So whenever Steiner spoke from that podium, I showed in the past, you can make a cross section of the Gertianum and it's related to the head and the skull. And that where the speaker's podium is corresponds to where the pineal gland is. And that the pineal gland is the seat of spirit self. Initially, the ego is residing in the forehead where the two petal lotus is. But when we approach the spirit self, the purification of the astral body being required for that, that brings about a communion with the world soul, with the Sophia, that is centered in this pineal gland, which causes it to shine because the Sophia then gives birth to the Christ. And it's only mineral substance that can nurture this grail. Uh, quest. So here you have these two individualities who came together as John the Baptist and Lazarus. One represents bringing the heavenly forces down, having a close connection with the Sophia being, and the other bringing the earth's fire forces and redeeming them, purifying them, transforming them, and these forces have especially to do also with sexuality, which is a fire force that uh, Yahweh brought into the lower nature in order to prevent the eighth sphere from drawing humanity prematurely out of his earthly connection to the earth. And so both of these individualities prepare uh, this future sixth age and both of their contributions flowed into anthroposophy. So you may recall in the temple legend, which Steiner often shared when he was doing his ritual work uh, in this Freemasonic uh, lodge, the anthroposophical version of it, you have this uh, casting of the brazen sea where the evil apprentices play their part and it explodes into a firestorm. And this was meant to be the final uh, work uh, after completing the Temple of Solomon. And so the Queen of Sheba was present, Solomon was present, but there was sort of a deal made between Solomon and the evil apprentices because he was jealous of the fact that the Queen of Sheba, who had initially come to join him in matrimony instead began to turn to Hiram because she recognized that he represented the future. So that jealousy kind of led him to allow this killing of Cain. Lazarus goes back to Cain, the killing of Hiram. He was hit on the left temple by the one of the backward uh, apprentices, then on the other temple, and then on the forehead. So that creates a kind of a triangle. But he had descended to the center of the earth after hearing a voice of his forefather, Tubalkine. And there at the center of the earth, he received the golden sun hammer. This is called the Tau hammer, the word hammer and with it he's able to complete the casting of the brazen sea and with it he receives the golden triangle. This golden triangle has to do with the secret of manas buddhi atman that Christ gave to humanity. So here I've tried to show a little bit of this 
transformation of lower love into higher love and the opposite inclination, which is that uh, behind the masculine, behind the feminine, each have their double. So the feminine has more of a luciferic double, the masculine more of an arimonic double. And the Azuric beings, as I mentioned before, if we don't bring the Christ in between our head and will, Ariman attacks through the will, through the feet especially. Lucifer attacks more through the head from above. And if the Christ is there in the middle, Ariman can't rise up and take hold of the thinking and drag it down into the lower nature, which is incl inclination. But if we don't bring the Christ into the middle, like is expressed in the sculptural group, then the Azuric beings take over that middle and they bring the double that's in the background of male and female into the foreground. And this leads to the beginning of gray magic, which is a form of sexual magic. And that leads to sadomasochistic forms of sexual expression, which already Steiner speaks of in his time being inspired by these Azuric beings, but they work more powerfully in America and spread influence uh, from there because America is a place where the subnature forces are strongest. And just as Lucifer is related to electricity, Ariman to magnetism, the Azuric beings are related to the nuclear force. And it was America on American soil that initially uh, detonated the first of the uh, atomic uh, bomb and the fact that the residue of that is uh, lead. Uh, you know, plutonium is kind of a refined form of the heaviest element and it leaves behind after its decay uh, lead and lead is the signature of Saturn. Saturn stands opposite to the future Atman, the future uh, Vulcan stage, which is the last stage of earthly evolution where spirit man, the redemption of the human father principle. And so uh, the body temple is what's then called for there. So I mentioned before uh, this whole element of uh, the larynx, conversation, and two or three are gathered in my vein. There I am in the midst of them. And on the other side of the bottom, you have this descent into the interior of the earth. Uh, the Azuric beings turn love downward towards the interior of the earth, which is what the black magicians strive for. You take the five-pointed star, it's the expression of the etheric when it's turned upward. But if you turn it upside down, it becomes the two-horned beast. And the black magician sends out their magical forces through those two horns. You could see when Hitler used his word and the microphone and the radio were brought on the scene to help propagate his voice to the masses that it had a kind of hypnotic influence. So that was an expression of the sun demon who more and more will take possession of those human beings that are the prey of the Azuric beings. So here we have this uh, letters to the seven churches related to the seven ages and there's the time periods involved. So we have these uh, on the left, the recapitulation of the Polarian and the ancient Indian, Hyperborean and the ancient Persian, the Christian uh, Chaldean Egyptian uh, is a recap of the Lemurian, and then the Greco-Latin is a recap of the Atlantean period. 
during that Atlantean uh, recapitulation, 747 BC to 1413 AD, uh, that's when the mystery of Golgotha took place. The middle between those two dates is the year 333. And the mystery of Golgotha took place 333 years before that, or you could say the baptism uh, took place. And then you have 333 years after that midpoint, you have the intervention of Zorat, the sun demon, around the 666 period. This is really the Antichrist, the counter force, the sun demon, the counter force uh, to the Christ who wants to take over the place of the Christ at the center of the earth is an organ where this battle for the future is located. And certain members of the backward brotherhoods, they want to deny the Christ to prevent human beings from witnessing the second coming and placing this being in his stead, who they will actually call the Christ being. And if this danger, which Steiner speaks of in, you have it in the secret uh, brotherhoods, I'll find that quote, uh, because it's kind of a significant, um, a significant, uh, these brothers, the brotherhoods I've mentioned, the ones who want to imprison human souls in the material sphere are aiming to make Christ's appearance pass by unnoticed in the 20th century. Their aim is to prevent people from noticing his arrival as an etheric individuality. This endeavor is developing under the influence of a specific idea or rather a specific impulse of will on behalf of an entirely different being, the brotherhoods, these are backward brotherhoods of the left as he's called, want to seize and conquer the sphere of influence that is supposed to come about through Christ in the 20th century and beyond. There are Western brotherhoods who are striving to deprive Christ of his impulse and put in its place a different individuality, one who has never even been on earth in the flesh, a purely etheric individuality, albeit a strictly arimonic one. All the measures I've been speaking about to do with the dead and so on, ultimately all of these serve the aims of distracting human beings from the Christ who passes through the mystery of Golgotha and of wrangling affairs in ways that will give another individuality dominance over the earth. This battle is entirely real and not at all a matter of abstractions. It is a battle that aims to put another being in the place belonging to the Christ being for the remainder of the fifth post-Atlantean age and also for the sixth and the seventh. One of the tasks of a healthy and honest spiritual development will be to exterminate and remove those endeavors which are eminently anti-Christian. So this is uh, uh, in the Secret Brotherhood's uh, Lecture 5. And it's worth studying this fairly deeply because this is a real danger, I believe, uh, and has very much to do with the apocalypse. So if these were to succeed, these aims, then you would have this situation where uh, the not only the end of our um, 
we find this here. Yeah, not only the uh, what's left of our age, which began in 1413, but the entire Philadelphia age, as well as the seventh age. So this is kind of a real threat he's talking about here. So in our time, we have to do with the mystery of evil, shown there under the Sardis. It's a European president uh, that began in 1413, last till 3574. And this is where we prophetically anticipating the Jupiter condition, the future of Jupiter, the new Jerusalem, the golden city. This is the ripe fruit that has to be carried over, that anthroposophy is preparing. And... Uh, the Philadelphia age is the Russian Slavic. Uh, that's the Philadelphia age. That'll be the ripe fruit that carries over into the period after the war of all against all. And that's really this Sophian new form of community, a higher form of group soul, where it's no longer based on blood, but spiritual kinship. And even though we speak of the Russian Slavic, it will include members from all over the earth who are aligned to the Michael Christ being. But the next epoch, the Laodicea American epoch from 5734 to 7894, that's called the lukewarm. We hear about the lukewarm will be spewn forth. Uh, this period uh, then will not help uh, to develop what's needed to overcome this war of all against all, but rather uh, the backward forces will uh, come into play. And so human beings who have anchored this Philadelphia, these Logos mysteries, have to begin to then during that time prepare for this war of all against all where egotism will grow stronger and stronger upon large swaths of humanity and in this uh, ch chart at the top steiner speaks of how over uh, evolution periods uh, we're actually not reaching full maturity uh, in our time, we're only reaching the age of about 21 to 28. Uh, back in ancient India, it was 49 to 56. Everybody who was at that age was wise because the spiritual world was contributing to their development. But in our time, if we don't do our own soul spiritual work, we won't grow beyond the age of 28. And in the future, uh, around the 4,000 AD, it'll be around 21. And then when you go uh, further into this, like 6,000, it starts to become like the age of 14. So this will lead to a, a situation where human beings, women will no longer be able to propagate. Strange as it may seem, conscientious cult research aiming to penetrate the laws of human evolution reveals a truth which may well cause dismay at first. It shows that in a time not at all that far ahead, possibly as early as the seventh millennium, all women will be infertile on earth. The withering and crumbling of human bodies will go so far that this will happen. Just think if the relationships that can only come into their own between the inner life and the physical body were to continue unchanged, people would no longer find anything to do on earth. The fact is that women will no longer be able to have children, even before the earth has gone through all of its stages. Human beings therefore have to find a different way of relating to earthly existence. The final stages of earth evolution will make it necessary for them to do without physical bodies and yet be present on the earth. In another quote, a time will come in the physical evolution of earth. It will be after the year 5700 when the, he fulfills, if he fulfills 
his rightful evolution, man will no longer tread the earth by incarnating in bodies derived from physical parents. In that epoch, women will be barren. Children will no longer be born in the manner of today if evolution on the earth takes its normal course. Uh, but he kind of speaks about how there must be no misunderstanding about such a fact as this. Something else, for example, might come about. And this is especially in that seventh American age, the overripe, the lukewarm, the Arimanic power, which under the influence of the impulses working in men today are becoming extremely strong, might succeed. There must be no understanding about such a fact. There's something else, for example, might come about the Arimanic powers, which under the influence of the impulses working in men today are becoming extremely strong, might succeed in preventing earth evolution in a certain respect. It would then become possible for men by no means for their good to be held in the same form of physical life beyond this time in the sixth or seventh millennium. They would become much more animals while continually be held in the grip of physical incarnation. One of the endeavors of the Arimanic powers is to keep humanity fettered too long to the earth in order to divert it from its normal evolution. So this is related to the important uh, contribution of the Slavic and Russian uh, folk spirit and people. They have the task of preparing in that sixth age what will carry over into the sixth epoch. They don't want this continuation onto the physical plane into the seventh uh, cultural epoch. But the Arimanic forces will want to continue that. And you could say there's a lot of evidence today that these things are already being prepared. The other spirits want to wipe out the entire past. This is from a lecture uh, GA203, where Steiner gives the first half uh, to the Luciferic tendency and the second to the Arimonic. The Luciferic spirits don't want us to really incarnate on the earth. They want to have us only exposed to what was given through old Saturn, old Sun, old Moon, up to the Lemurian. They don't want what's given in the Atlantean onward where the Arimonic forces come in. But the Arimonic forces don't want that past. They don't want the future. They only want the present, earthly. The other spirits want to wipe out the entire past, take away from the Elohim what man is out of the dust of the earth and make a new beginning, make evolution only begin from the earth onwards, away with this balloon of Saturn, sun, and moon. None of that is to have any meaning to man. A new evolution is to begin with the Earth. This is to be the new Saturn. Then a new Sun comes and so on. That is the ideal of these beings. They break into man's unconsciousness, into the will life, the med metabolic limb life. That is where they make their attack. They are that race among the spirit beings who want to give man a special interest for the mineral material, an interest in what is externally mechanistic, they would particularly like to destroy everything that the earth has brought over from the old moon. They would like the animal world to disappear, the physical human world to disappear, the plant world to disappear, and of the mineral world, only the physical laws to remain. Above all, they would like human beings to be removed from the earth and to form a new Saturn out of machines, a new world purely of machines, in this way, the world should go on. That is actually their ideal in the domain of external science. It is their ideal to reduce everything to matter, to mechanize everything. So this is, uh, this is sort of that inclination that's strongly apparent in our time. And here I'm just showing these rhythms that there is a kind of breathing if you go to the left side of the chart, you have a time uh, back uh, when 
the Kali Yuga began in 3101 BC. At that time, human beings were mostly in the spiritual. And as the bottom of the Lemnus Gate below the line shows, not very much in the physical. In the year 333, there was a balance between heaven and earth. The Greeks sort of celebrated that relationship between the earthly and the heavenly. But then we move into our time, 1899 was the end of the Kali Yuga. There you have the opposite condition to 3101, where now we're primarily down in the physical and very little in the spiritual, because we've continued to physically incarnate deeper and deeper. But now there's a reversal after 1899. The Christ impulse begins a 33 and a third year period after uh, 1899 that begins in 1900. You have in 30, uh, 1933, the sun demon Zorat opposing the first manifestation of Christ in 1933, where the second coming was meant to become visible. So you see how the oppositional forces are working and then in the future we'll have again a balancing and in the sixth age this age of philadelphia you'll again have the spiritual uh similar to before the kali yuga where we're uh reconnecting with the higher worlds so part of the picture that we need to take into account in order to understand this is that we're living between subnature and supernature forces and these subnature forces are growing ever more powerful because we're in the second half of earth evolution and electricity for example is decaying light that's been pulled down into subnature it's not the living light that the plants are uh, kissing with their blossoms uh, and love uh, which is the light ether uh, that streams down through the plants, through the stem of the plants, to the center of the earth. The plants have their common ego at the center of the earth. And that's where the Christ established his throne, the Christ who is the gardener, so to speak. But at the same place at the center of the earth is where magnetism of the earth is centered. Those are the fallen uh, sound ether forces. And that's Ariman's realm and where the north-south mountain ranges run on the west coast of Canada, United States, South America, that's where these forces are most powerful. That's a great rod of iron that the adversarial forces will use. That's where uh, Gates uh, uh, started his Microsoft empire. Uh, that's where Silicon Valley is located. That's where Hollywood is located and Hollywood's back door San Fernando Valley, where most of the pornography is developed and propagated around the planet. That's part of the flood of the dragon, that uh, we need the wings of the eagle to rise above that polluted astrality in our time. And uh, we know that the human being has a double, a doppelganger. And Steiner speaks of how that doppelganger enters the human being just before birth. and it resides in us, it's woven into the bioelectromagnetic forces in our organism. And that internal illnesses that arise internally, spontaneously from within, all are due to this double according to him. In Geographic Medicine, the second one, he speaks about this. And that uh, this is really a part of our nature that the Luciferic and Arimanic beings have access to. But the greatest frustration of the Arimanic double is that at death he has to leave the human uh, body. And so sometimes when you have somebody who's dying and you notice that their countenance have changed, they look like something of a blessing is there and that's really the double having left and one thinks well they're going to uh, come back but no they cross the threshold but the double has left them and the double's frustration is to not have to leave and so all of these ambitions of Ariman that come to expression in post-humanism transhumanism this is this ambition 
to upload or download human consciousness into the computer. And I've shown this uh, slide numerous times because it's very uh, important. Uh, Rudolf Steiner indicated that the Copernican evolution is really uh, only applicable to the physical, spatial, material realm. And that when we hear of the woman standing on the moon, crowned to the stars, clothed with the sun, and the dragon sends out the flood, we also hear that the dragon with his tail cast down a third of the stars to the earth. We keep hearing about that third over and over again in the book of Revelation. What is that? It's really that human beings through the Copernican revolution have turned to just the material physical universe and they've lost touch with the spiritual third. And that is a great tragedy because that's the home of the gods. And the adversary inspire us instead to want to go to the moon in a, in a rocket and establish a colony there and go to Mars uh, like Elon Musk. Uh, but the place that we're incarnated really is really only on the earth, which is there the head in this bigger part that's upside down. That's the macrocosm. We on the right there, I'm showing the microcosm. And that uh, for the human soul after death, the Ptolemaic system is correct. It's correct for the astral world that we enter, the etheric world that we enter after death. And so this body of this Adam Kadman being, which incorporates both those who are incarnated and those who are excarnated, the Christ is the true ego of this macrocosmic human being. But the adversarial forces, Zorat, wants to take over that position. The heart of this being is the sun, and the sun has a demon. And there's a relationship between the sun and the earth. I mentioned that the pineal gland is the metamorphosed heart. Well, the sun uh, was a part of the earth and left behind that sun organ at the center of the earth that the plants are oriented to with their roots and that's where the Christ entered but it's also the place where the black magicians the ninth layer of the earth seek to enter so there's a battle at the center of the earth and just like there's a battle at the center of the her head in the pineal gland and we can participate in that through the rhythm of the night and the day where we have to work with the morning and the evening forces as opposed to the midnight and the midday forces uh, in order to bring about the shining of this organ in our head and bring about a lemniscate between head and heart the etherization of the blood that can shine in that organ there's a corresponding shining for the whole earth in the second coming of christ in the etheric which has a golden aura around it, which are the sun thoughts having to do with through the angel that uh, was extinguished with its consciousness through the materialistic souls crossing the threshold in the height of materialism, uh, which Steiner says was in the 1840s. So that 19th century, uh, this extinguishing of the Christ consciousness in the realm of the angel brought about a death another death of Christ, this time in the angelic realm, which has its lower member in the etheric. But Christ overcame that death, and the second coming is really a manifestation of that. So surrounding the earth, which can be related to the human head, and the satellite that surrounds it as the moon is related to the earth, just like silver is related to the back of a mirror, our brain is related to the moon. The moon is related to those silver forces. And when the moon is a perfect vessel, a reflector of the sun, a vessel for the sun, then you have the grail vessel. But if instead you have the head of John the Baptist in that vessel, then you have the anti-grail. So behind Herod was these anti-Christian forces that want to prevent the Christ impulse from taking hold. 
So I would like to say that the whole earth is the city of Babylon. Through our electronic connections with the World Wide Web, with the internet, the whole earth is becoming one great city. And there are certain hubs of this. But everywhere, this city is being built with a vengeance. And I bring this again, the emergence of the new sphere, where a new thinking sphere around the earth, but it has two aspects. It has one that has to do with the etheric of Christ in the second coming, the resurrected thoughts, the Micaelic thoughts that have flowed into anthroposophy that Rudolf Steiner brought uh, to the earth and shared through the 6,000 lectures through the word. And you have at the same time, the electromagnetic forces around the earth, uh, which are being exploited with the use of satellites and earth stations and the internet, etc. So over the last 80 years, we've conceived, designed and built a global computer network linking over 4,000, 4, 4.66 billion users, 66% of the world population, and linking 99% of the world's 2 billion computers. These computers represent a combined processing power of one septillion. Uh, to put this in perspective, we don't expect to have a supercomputer of this power until at least 2030. So we have a world processing power that currently amounts to all the human all the connected humans plus all the connected computers. That's 4.66 billion humans plus 2 billion computers times one exaflop equals 6.66 billion exaflops. But according to present calculations, we're going to have a billion times this much in several decades. So modern physics, have, uh, this has to do with this uh, relationship to electricity. Modern physics has conjoined, conjured and juggled about with electricity in a strange way without least suspicion. They imagine that atoms as something electric and through the general static state of consciousness of the present time, they forget that whenever they think of an atom as an electric entity, they must describe a moral impulse to this atom and indeed to every atom. At the same time, they must raise it to the rank of a moral entity, but I am not speaking correctly for in reality, when we transform an atom into an electron, we do not transform it into a moral, but into an immoral entity. Electricity contains to be sure moral impulses, impulses of nature, but these impulses are immoral. They are instincts of evil which must be overcome by the higher worlds. The greatest contrast to electricity is light. If we look upon light as electricity, we confuse good and evil. We lose sight of the true conception of evil in the outer order of nature. If we do not realize that through the electrification of atoms, we transform them into carriers of evil. We do not only transform them into carriers of death, as explained in my last lecture, but into carriers of evil. When we think of them as atoms in general, when we imagine matter in the form of atoms, we transform these atoms into carriers of death. But when we electrify matter, nature is conceived as something evil, for electric atoms are little demons of evil. In another place, he speaks of by looking at the world in this fashion, we create a kind of a cult imprisonment that humanity then becomes subject to. So I showed this last time and I'm showing it again. We have the whore of Babylon down below in the middle of that upside down turned star. Remember that's the inverted etheric uh, that's been pulled down into subnature. Uh, comes to expression, electricity is a fallen Lucifer, Ariman, in terms of magnetism, electromagnetism combines the two, 
and the Azuric having to do with the nuclear force. But there's more to that nuclear force. Uh, there's more to the Azuric uh, than just the nuclear. The nuclear is just the beginning. It's a very primitive uh, situation we're uh, working when we're using uh, these atoms uh, in the chain of events that lead to the nuclear explosion. Uh, it's like if we see this as the all matter related to the music of the spheres, the hydrogen end of that music would be the light notes. That's the first uh, atom, if we speak of atoms. The sun is primarily hydrogen and uh, helium is the second one. You can see how levity governs on that end of the spectrum. But on the other end, we have the heaviest elements that we then refine to create plutonium, which we use for these bombs. And then, of course, we also create hydrogen bombs. So we misuse these sun forces. These are related to the azuric forces, which we're releasing. And that these will bring about the premature death of the Earth. Ariman wants to push human beings across the threshold before they're ready, before they're ripe. And so uh, we're like on a piano, just hitting the dark notes when we're playing with these uh, heavier elements. And we're creating new heavier elements that weren't there before. So I won't uh, go with this uh, at this point, but I just uh, recall that we spoke about this intervention that Steiner predicted before we can meet the Christ in the etheric. We have to meet the beast who rises from uh, the abyss, the two-horned beast, that Zorat, who, as he described, came to expression through the being of Hitler, who used his voice to hypnotize the masses. He was possessed by this being. Steiner, in his priest culture, or priest lecture, said in this third intervention, uh, that's in uh, uh, 1998, will be the strongest, and that you will have uh, hosts of Zorat in which he will incorporate, and it will show even on their countenance. They will be like beasts, and they will seek to pull the spiritual down into this dark and uh, polluted sphere that the dragon spews out. And so we have uh, the mystery of birth and death in the fourth age, but now we're dealing with the mystery of evil. And this Zorat is closely related to Ariman. You might remember how Ariman remained behind on the sun. Zorat is the sun demon. So when you see the two-horned beast that uh, rises from the dry land, it's Ariman, but incorporating into Ariman is then the sun demon. And we are approaching a time where there will be actual physical incarnation of Ariman. And America is the suitable place for this. So all this technology is preparing for that. This again shows that same rhythm and uh, how the counter ego is the two horned beast. He wants to take over this Adam Kadman, take over the place of Christ, the sacrificial lamb. The sacrificial lamb is described as having seven horns and seven eyes. The sun rules uh, the seven planetary forces, those are the horns and the seven eyes see through uh, these organs, which really belong to the solar logos. And so he brings the seven into harmony as opposed to the seven that we see in the seven-headed dragon. The seven-headed dragon, if we imagine, uh, comes at different times. When the dragon came during the First and Second World War, 
he brings us back to reviving the old racial identity at a time when we're meant to outgrow it. And this dragon has one body, but the seven heads actually fight against each other. And we saw this during the First and Second World War. Those heads were fighting against each other. And one head is always dominant in this. So we hear of how one head was wounded and it healed. So Germany, which was the place where the sun demon was incarnating in that Germanic racial sort of uh, group soul, that being, that head was wounded in the First World War, but it was healed and then perpetuated the Second World War. So we have to keep an eye on how these things manifest themselves. And Zorad, of course, worked 8666 back in Jundi Shapur. That sun demon impulse carried over into the Arab stream. The Arab stream created a kind of shield of absorbing a great deal of what otherwise would have brought a premature consciousness soul. But this Arab stream absorbed much of that, and it created a, uh, a throwback to the Father God, a moon religion, at a time when the Christ had brought the new sun impulse. So that you can see in Harun al-Rashid, who later incarnates as the inspirer of the Royal Society in England, uh, that uh, even though the West in Europe uh, pushed back the Muslim invasion, you have Francis Bacon, uh, the reincarnated Harun al-Rashid, who then uh, brings the scientific materialism, which gives birth to the first industrial revolution, which in turn gives second industrial revolution. Here again, it's an all-male society. Women weren't allowed. And this impulse from Gundi Shapur came into the Hagia Sophia in 869 and inspired the Catholic Church, which had brought with it the Roman uh, legal uh, approach and brought that into religion and turned it into dogmas and doctrine. And those doctrines then hardened. And at that particular council, the trichotomy of the human being which was the heritage from the initiates of the past, the true Christian initiates, was denied. And instead, the human being was said to be just twofold. And that uh, the spirit was denied. And this gave the clergy of the church uh, a magnified power because they were supposed to be the representative of the spirit. And here you have in the ninth century, this division. That's the time when the grail happened. Steiner says at the exact same time when this impulse took place at the Eighth Ecumenical uh, Council, there was a uniting of the Christ who was brought by the Arthurian Knights who uh, saw Christ as the solar logos, uh, as the sun being that lived in the etheric world. They came from the west. And then there were the Grail Knights who carried the impulse of Joseph of Arimathea, where the blood that was gathered beneath the cross into that sacred vessel that had also been used at the Last Supper became the uh, Grail secret that was carried out down the ages. So the Grail Knights and the Arthurian Knights united in 869. And it's around that same time you then have the crowning of Parsival as the new Grail King. So there was then a separation of esoteric Christianity and the East uh, uh, had then the Orthodox uh, Christianity. And in the middle, you had then the Roman Church. This is Pope Nicholas that uh, Steiner talked about. The next impulse was 
the Sun Demon working through the torturing of the Knights Templars by Philip Le Bel, the King of France, who had uh, kind of, you could say, took, taken the Roman uh, Pope hostage. He created a what's called the Babylonian uh, captivity of the papistry by transferring it to Avignon, France. And these were really seen later as sort of anti-popes, and one of them was used to instigate the suppression of the Templars, which eventually led uh, to them uh, after being arrested and tortured uh, to them being uh, burned at the stake, many of them, including the Grand Master Jacques de Molay. And so they had, uh, for the first uh, nine or so years, spent just the, th the nine of them or so at uh, uh, the Temple Mount uh, and the Al As Mosque, which is now a uh, next to the Great Dome of the Rock, uh, which was originally where Solomon's uh, Temple was located. So here you have then the burning of these representatives of esoteric Christianity. They're thrown into the spiritual world with powerful spiritual forces. Rudolf Steiner indicated that it was these disembodied Templars that helped to inspire Goethe's fairy tale, which was an extract of this great culmination of the Michael school that began in the 14th to the 16th century and then culminated in a ritual cultus kind of event. And that that was a preparation for anthroposophy and uh, that Goethe received a kind of extract of that mediated by these high and lofty Templars that resulted in this fairy tale that Rudolf Steiner was given at the age of 21 and would later say that this is the germinal seed capsule out of which anthroposophy was born. He gave his first esoteric lecture, I believe it was in 1900, in front of a theosophical group and that led to him being elected the leader of the Theosophical Society in German in, in 1902. So here again, we have the threshold that we've all been going through since the 1840s when the sixth trumpet began to sound. And leading up to this, there's what Steiner called in the uh, working of the angels in the human astral body, that there are three uh, qualities that human beings have to develop in order to partake in the second coming of the Christ in the etheric. They are like the messengers, the Holy Spirit, that overlight human beings. And these will help to prepare the sixth age. Uh, and they're also reflected in uh, the three occultisms. So Rudolf Steiner says, if we don't take up what the angels are weaving in the astral body, then uh, we will have a situation where instead they push it down into our etheric body while we're asleep and our ego and astral are outside of our physical and etheric. And then it will be turned into its opposite, into a negative. And that gives birth to three negative versions of eugenic, hygienic, and mechanical occultism. And we can sort of start to look at our time to see where we can see these being manifested. But the ideal is to create a positive form of eugenic occultism, which is the gift of the East. These are called the cloud people in this imagination. The, uh, they are the thinking people. And uh, then in the middle Europe, you have the uh, rainbow people, the feeling people that give birth to eugenic or hygienic occultism, I mean, the healing occultism that Steiner worked with Ita Wegman on developing that. And anthroposophical medicine, you could say it also flows into many other things like eurythmy, healing eurythmy, etc. 
and then you have mechanical occultism. Uh, Steiner says that the you will have aberrations in sexuality as a result of the caricature of the eugenic occultism. You will have uh, forms of medicine that are said to be healing, but they're actually make us sick. You could say genetic engineering and other forms of manipulating the human genome would fall into that category. Uh, but there's many other examples one could give. And then mechanical occultism will lead to where human beings, uh, and especially the Anglo-American people, will have this uh, gift to develop these, and the American continent is most propitious for that. And this has to do with the death forces of the double in our organism will grow stronger and stronger, and eventually we'll be able to uh, set machines in motion with those forces of the double by learning how to uh, regulate them. But Steiner gave an example of a positive form of this with uh, the figure uh, in his mystery play of uh, Strader. Uh, Strader has a special relationship to this woman that he marries, who has uh, an experience of the Christ. So with the help of this spirit of the Christ, this danger of mechanical occultism can be overturned and instead give birth to a form of connection to the world of machines that can be beneficent and uh, take over much of the labor and free human beings for other kinds of, of work. So this again is the big sweep and the danger is the eighth sphere that the adversarial forces are seeking to draw us into and we need to build the new Jerusalem, the golden city. We need to co-create it together with the Christ forces. Uh, but the adversarial forces out of this imagination that modern science give, we have transhumanism. That's an effort that uh, Ariman hopes uh, will lead to him being able to maintain a connection to human thinking beyond death. They especially attack the thinking, the head, everything that has to do with thinking uh, to uh, turn it into these electrical, electromagnetic forces and uh, this post-humanism, physical immortality takes on a kind of pseudo-religious dimension. And so I mentioned earlier, Ariman's greatest frustration is the doppelganger has to leave. Uh, Steiner called libraries the citadel of Ariman because they retain human intelligence. But the Google is sort of a repository of the thinking of humanity that's growing ever more all-encompassing. And AI is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, ChatGPT4 uh, will soon give way to ChatGPT5. You can speak to it. It'll be more and more embodied in a bio uh, type of um, humanoid robot. Uh, these robots are being developed at a tremendous pace in China. Elon Musk is one of the uh, people who's developing uh, one of these robotics and he expects to have them on the market by 2026. They are starting in 2025 to already use them in their own factories, Tesla factories, etc. And he, of course, also has Neuralink. Uh, they have their second person now who has that implanted with the blessing of the FDA. And uh, they're able to control computers, play video games, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and here on the right, you have a chart of the growth of SpaceX Starlink, which is satellites. They expect to have 30, 42,000 of them uh, down the road. Here shows some of the different companies that are planning these, including Jeff Bezos. These people were brought up on Star Wars and uh, 
Star Trek and all of this, they have that Arimonic uh, imagination uh, from an early childhood. Here's a distribution of servers. Uh, these are often called the cloud, but it's not the cloud. It's really these huge warehouses filled with servers. And those servers, there's a tremendous purchasing right now of the NVIDIA chips, which are the main ones that are being used uh, for these uh, latest AI developments. And it takes a tremendous amount of electricity. So there's supposed to be a doubling of these in the not too distant future. So uh, Steiner at one point said that where we have these electric factories, it's like a hole in the cosmos. And so the mass production of robots, humanoid robots, there's female robots, there's sex robots, there's uh, robots are going to show up in people's houses. Uh, China's uh, just putting one on the market that'll be $16,000, which is fairly cheap. So they are setting up uh, competition. And uh, here's kind of, uh, again, the golden triangle that uh, Hiram received at the center of the earth from his forefathers. It's the gift that Christ gave. It was prophetically there then already. And so the Christ gave us the possibility of the future Jupiter, future Venus, future Vulcan, spirit self, life spirit, spirit man. But because of human freedom, we're in danger of this eighth sphere, which I would say is the head of that Adam Kadman. The earth itself is the eighth sphere and we're protected from it to some extent with the moon that had exited in the Lemurian uh, period. Uh, and that was the same thing that the Earth holding the moon in its orbit is the macrocosmic counterpart to our consciousness in relation to our sexuality that has been planted into the unconscious. But that protection that kept us from succumbing to the luciferic tendency away from the earth, the human generative capacity, the racial blood relationship, the group soul kept us on the earth. Yahweh implanted that. But Steiner indicated that that protection would only last until the time of the Christ when the true ego was implanted. And so now we need to take the Christ in to protect ourselves from the allure of the eighth sphere. Uh, the moon will reunite with the earth in the uh, seventh uh, millennium, which is the period uh, where we lead over from the war of all against all to this uh, uh, age of the um, seals. That's the end of our earth epoch. And after that, we have the division of humanity into the ugly and the uh, beautiful. But that's also where women become barren before that already. The Slavic Russian people want to keep that in its right timing. But the uh, seventh epoch, when the American will come to the fore, they will try to keep propagation going on the physical plane. And that's another theme to go into deeper next time. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, Florian, thank you so much for your super intense presentation. This uh, so dear friends, um, wow. So it's uh, practically, it's longest presentations, two hours plus. Um, shall we make Maybe uh, make it two minutes, three minutes uh, for break so Florian can restore his waist. And uh, Florian, I hope you hope you have some glass of water. Yeah, Hello. that's fine with me. Thank yeah, you. Um, so, like in three minutes, we will be back. Or okay. Those who would like to leave will leave. So, mm -hmm. but maybe some people will stay and ask some significant questions. Okay, so three minutes. Okay, is there for thank you. Bye bye.
Okay, it looks like we are we are back. Oh, plenty of people. So, dear friends, do you know how to raise your electronic hand? Speaking about. So, if, um, if you put your arrow on reactions, which is in the bottom of your, your screen. And there is button raise hand. So, so, uh, first. Florian, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Who is first? Hey, Jeremy is first. Yeah, I had two. Thank you for that incredible presentation, as I'm sure we'll all say. I'll have to go back over it again because I couldn't take it all in at one time. I, have, I think I have two, hopefully, relatively short questions. So the in the images of the apocalypse, would the, um, the two-horned beast arising from the land, would that correspond to the current or soon to occur um, incarnation of Ariman. That's the first question. And the second question is, I know you touched on it briefly toward the end there, but could you elaborate just a little bit further on the significance of the uh, recombining of the moon with the earth, which I think you said, was that gonna be in the seventh cultural epoch? Could you just make a, another comment or two about that? Thanks. Yeah, so the uh, image of the two pillars uh, that uh, make the feet or legs of the sun being uh, whose countenance is like the sun, who has a rainbow above his head, his body is like a cloud, he has a book uh, open that uh, John is encouraged to read and it tastes like honey in his mouth, but bitter in his belly. We hear seven thunders utter their voices, and John is about to write, but told not to. Certain secrets there that I feel have to do with these seven unutterable truths, which were held closely. Rudolf Steiner was one of the first to reveal all seven of them. Uh, it's beginning in a Paris lecture where Edward Chouret was present and took notes. And there uh, you have then this uh, pillar, uh, this fourth seal has to do with the earth stage in the largest span because uh, the earth is the fourth stage of uh, the planetary development. But for our time, with regards to this consciousness soul interpretation that Steiner gave to the priests, uh, and he spoke of that in the 13th uh, lecture out of the 18, uh, there he speaks of this uh, trumpet, uh, six trumpets sounding in the 1840s, and that continued to sound until the turn of the millennium. We know that 1841 was the beginning of the battle in heaven, where Michael engaged uh, a battle with these spirits who were preventing humanity from witnessing the spiritual world. So by casting those down to the earth, the heavens were opened again so that we could have the end of the Kali Yuga in 1899 and the new dawning of a golden age. But after having uh, reach the end of the Kali Yuga and this deep descent, that you have uh, this uh, characterized in the 10th and 11th chapter. So the reason the, uh, the two legs are red and blue and have the Yachim and Boaz is those are related to the measuring of the temple that is described in the 11th chapter. And so there's certain secrets in the, in the temple that I tried to speak about last time where the pillars are the legs of the temple, the altar of incense would be where the heart of the temple is, 
uh, the seven branch candelabra, the 12 showbread relate to human beings turning up to the cosmos, the heavens, but the holy of holies, which only the priest entered through that fourfold veil representing earth, air, water, fire, was torn open at the mystery of Golgotha and human beings began to be able to see into these mysteries. It became a public uh, event for humanity, what was kept secret. And uh, I think that the dragon that rises out of the water, that's in the, the 13th chapter after the woman has uh, appeared uh, in the 12th chapter, you have those two beasts appearing. So uh, they're not there yet. Uh, when you have the first crossing of the threshold, humanity doesn't really see them yet. But as we cross, uh, like into our time, when you cross a threshold, thinking, feeling, willing, uh, separate. The same happens for humanity. And Eastern humanity has more of the danger of the Luciferic. Western humanity, more of the Arimanic. And that's related also to the eugenic, the birth mysteries, and the mechanical occultism, which are more the Western mysteries, and the hygienic in between with Middle Europe. So yes, you could say that this um, beast with the two horns, you could say when uh, this year, 1933 that I referenced uh, several times where uh, Steiner predicted that before the Christ could be witnessed in the etheric, one would have to meet uh, the two-horned beast, so to speak. Uh, and that was then embodied in Hitler. Hitler, you could say, is a precursor of the incarnation of Ahriman. It's not the incarnation of Ahriman as yet, uh, but uh, that's something we're uh, moving towards, and as I said, the, the America is more the propitious place for this individuality to incarnate. And Steiner indicated that before even a small part of the new millennium uh, passes, this incarnation will take place. So there's a lot of guessing games as to when that will occur. Some people have suggested it will occur in the next Orifial Age, which is a, a sort of a Saturn Archangel. Uh, uh, but I think uh, we need to be remain vigilant and careful about uh, these things uh, because uh, what the Arimanic forces do is the opposite of what the Luciferic, the Luciferic forces lead us back into the past with a certain exception. Uh, they take us back to the old uh, Saturn, Sun and Moon, as I was saying, they want to go back before the ego really came in. Uh, but Ariman wants to take us too quickly into the future. So this writer, Alvin Toffler, wrote a book called Future Shock and it had to do with the future arriving before human beings were ready to, to meet it. And Richard Dawkin, uh, Dawkins just wrote an article on the same subject. Uh, there's an, a whole book uh, on uh, asking the question is, uh, what's, how do we see this future shock now with uh, those years behind us since uh, Alvin Toffler wrote that book? But uh, uh, this is sort of the, the danger is that the technology outruns us. The technology gets ahead of us and we're not able to navigate. And more and more, if we have these robots that are more intelligent than us around us that are supposed to be our assistants, how long will that last uh, to where, unlike us, when we want to gain knowledge, we have to individually work at it over long periods of time. That's why Steiner said it's easy for young people to gain knowledge very quickly, but to turn knowledge from head knowledge to heart knowledge takes a longer period of time. So old people have an advantage there over young people to turn head knowledge into heart knowledge. And anthroposophy really arises out of heart thinking. And so, uh, 
Ariman, uh, as I said, uh, comes through the feet uh, from below. He's related to the human will, which is the most unconscious part of our nature. And he then seeks to, if Christ is not there in the heart, he wants to pull the thinking down to serve the lower nature. He's the inspirer of Darwinism. We're just higher animals. There is no true higher ego. And so all of this uh, uh, transhumanism, posthumanism, these imaginations, those are all sort of uh, suggesting that Ariman is approaching. And I, uh, I feel like this alliance recently between Elon Musk, who I kind of showed turning to the dark side in that uh, slide, uh, he has a tremendous uh, relationship to technology, uh, but he has, uh, some would say he's sort of a white nationalist of sorts, might not want to admit it. And there's an alliance now between Donald Trump and Elon Musk. So without going you know, deep into politics, uh, there is uh, a left and the right both have their extremes. Obviously, the Soviet uh, Union uh, succumbed to Bolshevism, which is a left, uh, China to Bolshevism. Both of those have dictatorial regimes at the moment. Uh, but you see the rise of the right-wingers as well in Europe uh, and in America, there's uh, gaining ground. Uh, January 6th uprising at the Capitol was sort of uh, uh, radical right-wingers, even though they wanted to limit on the left. So yes, I would say that beast on the right, uh, not only you have an incarnation of Ariman, but into Ariman in, uh, incorporates uh, this Zorat being, just like the Christ incarnated into the Jesus being. So the Arimanic incarnation will be more complex but Steiner says, by the turn of this century, there will be more and more people who will be incarnated uh, in this fashion of being uh, sort of uh, possessed uh, by uh, Zorat. Steiner spoke of how Nietzsche was uh, sort of uh, in his later life possessed by Ariman and that Ariman would more and more appear as an author. So I feel that certain forms of autism, like you notice with certain forms of autism where these people can't look you in the eye, they lack emotional connection with others, uh, that uh, they have uh, often very strong will in connection with a particular sphere. Elon Musk said he was diagnosed as autistic, uh, but it's almost like a compulsive relationship. But some of this can be seen as uh, an incorporation of this Arimanic double moving from the background to the foreground. Uh, Silicon Valley has a huge amount of people who are on that spectrum. These are people who are on that spectrum who are functional. And so uh, Ariman, of course, in Steiner's depiction, lacks the forehead, lacks the heart. So this lack of connection to other people, not being able to look them in the eye, not having social skills, and lacking that forehead means that there is often a lack of control uh, because that's the frontal lobe where the executive function is centered. So, uh, so yes, that... Uh, uh, two-horned beast that rises out of the dry land can both relate to Ariman, his incarnation, but the uh, timing is a question. And your other other uh, question, uh, maybe you could just repeat it uh, one more time, so I'm kind of fresh with that. Well, if you would just offer a few remarks. Uh about the, the significance of the uh, recombining of the earth with uh, the moon with the earth, which I think you were saying was, was it around the seventh cultural epoch time or in there? Yeah, so the, the, 
sort of the eighth millennium, which is the uh, 7,000s. Uh, that's the period that uh, involves this transition from uh, the seventh age, cultural age, to the seventh epoch. That's where then you have this division of humanity into the good and evil uh, race and where we will bear in our features uh, our inner moral qualities, whether they're good or bad, and that then human beings will incarnate into one or the other of these two groups. And prior to that, you will have then the cessation of propagation in the old uh, form of the two sexes. Rudolf Steiner says that the future androgyny, the male principle will be in the foreground and that the change in the voice in the male around the time of puberty is a expression of that connection between the two. So uh, over time in the future, the earth will become, uh, will spiritualize so that uh, just like it's become denser and denser since the end of the Kali Yuga, there's a loosening. And the more human beings uh, embrace the spiritual, uh, the more they redeem Lucifer, uh, which is uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit involves redeeming Lucifer. And that creates enthusiasm for knowledge. Lucifer is uh, related to that fire that rises above the heads of the disciples in the upper room, which is a prefiguration of the age of the Holy Spirit, which we're in now. And Michael leads that age of the Holy Spirit on behalf of Christ. He's the countenance of the Christ being. So you have this reconnection with the moon. Obviously, it's not going to be the physical dense moon that we see now, that there's an astralization that would occur between now and then. And human beings will need to learn to live in the etheric as their lowest member. So that's kind of a, a process uh, when the physical bodies will reach a point where they can't support us anymore. That's like the first death. And there's then the ascent into the etheric, uh, which is a kind of second death for those who can't manage that transition where uh, manas is embodied in the angels. They have there's a lowest member the etheric, uh, and we have to develop an etheric uh, that is really the gift of the Nathan Jesus being. The Nathan Jesus being is our higher self. So just as we hear about the bodies of the Christ uh, being multiplied and given as gifts, the uh, terms of spiritual economy, a future gift that we each are called to take in is uh, replicas of the Nathan Jesus uh, being. And this being never participated in the fall of humanity. Uh, this being still never participated in the division of the sexes. Uh, this being, who's called the sister soul of Adam, uh, is really the grail vessel. And I believe the new technology, the moral technology Steiner speaks of, is related to reintegrating this being because when the fall of humanity happened, because there was a danger of the Luciferic influence also penetrating the etheric, that the higher ethers, which were the life ether and the chemical ether were withdrawn. And this is really the Nathan Jesus being who retains those higher ethers. And we need those higher ethers to build this future body that we were gonna, are gonna be needing. So just as Steiner indicated that the mystery of Golgotha is the fourth intervention of the Christ in human evolution, that there were three previous ones, and each time the Nathan Jesus being was the vessel. And this being has his home in the mother lodge of humanity, 
and is really uh, closely related to John the Baptist, the Adam soul, so to speak, uh, the oldest soul in a certain respect. And uh, you can see this Raphael Novalis being who leads towards the sixth age as having an affinity to that being. You might remember when uh, Mary, uh, the mother of this Nathan Jesus, uh, visited her uh, cousin Elizabeth. Cousin Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy that John the Baptist, who was in her womb, leapt and it was felt. And she then uttered, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, so to speak. This was kind of a spiritual awakening that John the Baptist saw needs this stimulus from outside. Uh, but anyways, that uh, reoccurrence of the moon, I think the Pacific region where the moon exited has a special relationship to that return of the moon. And uh, this is an area where the earth is not so dense. It's mostly this uh, watery element and the Hawaiian islands are really condensed fire forces. And uh, uh, unlike the volcanoes around the Pacific Rim, which are explosive, these uh, the volcanism here in the middle of the Pacific is much softer. It uh, is something to where when the volcano erupts, people rush to the Big Island to see it, instead of like these other shield volcanoes where they run away as fast as they can and as far away as possible because they're very dangerous. So there's a more feminine character. They talk of the goddess Pele, for example, uh, related to these uh, forces. Uh, one of my colleagues wrote several books on Hawaiian uh, lore uh, that uh, uh, we can kind of learn something from. But anyways, that's uh, just a contribution for that theme of the return of the moon. Is that Van James? Yes, Van James. Yeah, thank you very much, Florian. Okay, yeah, yeah, he's next. Well, first of all, let me thank you, Florian, for the most enlightening and inspiring presentation that you offer to us tonight. I have uh, one comment and one question. The comment is, and I'm glad that you mentioned politics because this comes into it. Because the present age is not a recapitulation of any previous age, it means that now we have the opportunity to create the future, in, in a, to put it in a very simplistic way. Also, because it's not a recapitulation, we are, be, we are witnessing the beginning of what is going to be in the end of, at the end of time, the battle of all against all. There is already a split, a very clear split in humanity. If you just look at statistics, uh, from political elections all over the world, you will notice that instead of having like 30% uh, on one side and 70 on the other, is very, very close to 50, 49, 51, 48, 52. So the split is really beginning to be visible already. Mm -hmm. And in one uh, lecture uh, relating to vaccination in one lecture relating to vaccination Steiner suggests that the only way to counterbalance all the negativity is to cultivate is to cultivate spirituality within ourselves either through meditation or study uh, of spiritual science and and this kind of thing The question is about the sexual aberration, and it might be of very little interest to most of you, but what exactly is it meant by aberration? 
because we are witnessing again in very uh, recent times almost the demonization of everything that is considered not normal sexually. So I'm, I'm really interested if, if anyone has a clearer idea of what Steiner meant by aberration, because I cannot possibly believe that all the gays and lesbians and trans are to be considered aberrations. Um, it's just something that is normal for whoever happened to be that way. Uh, can you, d does anyone have an answer to this question? Um, I, I understood that as, um, you know, people who um, are pedophiles and, you know, sort of deviant, um, um, morally, um, you know, low um, activities. I didn't understand it as, because he says we're going to be androgynous again. Yeah, and uh, uh, when Steiner mentions the uh, Azuric influence, uh, he mentions kind of uh, uh, the kind of, uh, he uses the word, the uh, kind of glare of, it's like a group sexuality, for example, that uh, is practiced in the cities. Something in that uh, direction was one of the themes there. Uh, we know from uh, his other uh, indications about black and white magic that on the one side there is this uh, impulse to ennoble and to raise uh, love uh, up. Uh, you could say the churches uh, did that through the sacramentalizing of marriage, uh, whereas in these black magical rituals, which include sexual rights. You have someone like Alistair Crowley, uh, who uh, his mother suggested he was kind of uh, embodying what was considered the beast uh, of the book of Revelation. And uh, he uh, sort of welcomed that designation. Uh, he was one of those uh, practitioners of this kind of sexual uh, magic. And uh, uh, the uh, thing that you have with uh, the practices of uh, black magic is uh, the ABCs Steiner describes is cutting into the flesh of living animals, uh, for example. And uh, uh, you, over time, if uh, you gain a certain power from this because you absorb this astrality that is being frightened and harmed and it causes in the astral body an inversion of the healthy sequence uh, when you excarnate and you enter the astral world after uh, releasing the etheric body uh, then you go backwards over your life and you experience how you've impacted other people. If you've hurt them, you feel their pain. If you've uh, brought them joy, you feel their joy. But through this black magical practice of taking pleasure in pain, which is a sadistic tendency, you invert that. So rather than rising up in purgatory to prepare to enter the heavenly region, the sun region, the lower Devakan and higher Devakan, you're instead penetrating the interior of the earth and you're becoming more and more of a lonely person who has no love for others, but uh, embracing power over others. And of course, the black magical rites uh, that were there in Mexico and in South America, where according to Steiner, there was a counter uh, event to the mystery of Golgotha that took place there. And where uh, a, a black magician was crucified at the same time that the Christ was crucified in order to banish those forces for a period of time, but that they would make a comeback in the future. Uh, so you have on the one hand that the human being for a male has a female etheric and for a female has a male etheric 
And uh, since uh, I think it's the 17th century or so, there's been a loosening of the etheric in the region of the heart since Greek times in the head. So as this etheric body loosens, it invites that contrasexual opposite into our consciousness. So a lot of people are experiencing that other side of their nature, uh, and that is part of what draws uh, them into this gender bending, etc. Now, uh, uh, partly what's going on is uh, on the left, uh, which its agenda is DEIJ at this point, and then LGBTQ+, and uh, they kind of put them together, but uh, these are forms of neo-Marxist uh, uh, political agenda, uh, Marx was a Darwinist. Uh, Engels, a friend of his, was one of the first to get the manuscripts from uh, Darwin. And Darwin, of course, just said we're just higher animals. So on the one side of the political spectrum right now, we have the religious right, which has a kind of caricature of religion, whether it's, you know, fanatics uh, uh, in Islam or people who uh, take uh, the Bible in a very materialistic way uh, type of thing and sometimes mix that with white nationalism and anti-immigration and all of this. And on the other side, you have uh, the left-leaning, which uh, has taken in this uh, political correctness, which is an outside-in morality that's not in right timing anymore, any outside-in morality that tells us what to think what not to think, how to act, and that uh, the, uh, this neo-Darwinism is mixed together with postmodern philosophy. Postmodern philosophy, when it looks at race, de-emphasizes the biological dimension of race and, and gives the impression that it's all just socially conditioned. And it does the same with gender. So it says that gender isn't biologically determined. It's really a social conditioning. So they want to uh, undo that and give people the freedom to choose. But if you look at things from the vantage point of reincarnation and karma, generally a male-female incarnation uh, are considered as one. And at least usually two such incarnations, one male, one female, take place within each cultural age, which is 2,160 years, so that the ideal is this balancing of male and female to prepare us for this future mission and task. So the middle between the sexes uh, needs to become a bridge, a meeting place like the caduceus, as opposed to uh, an abyss. Uh, that can't be crossed. And so uh, gay, lesbian are on both sides of that sexual divide, but there isn't generally the bridge between the sexes. And wholeness was divided when the sexes divided in the Lemurian period. Our future androgyny means we have to, within each of us, bring the two genders together to where we have an inner marriage between the head, where the masculine is more in the foreground, and the heart, where the feminine is more in the foreground. Goethe embodied that and celebrated it when he said the eternal feminine draws us upward. So that as a man, he saw this higher feminine as his ideal. So I think uh, uh, we each have to navigate these things in our own uh, way, whether it's the political divide, I agree. Steiner indicated that in America, there would be a greater uh, difference between male and female, that this would become ever more extreme. The danger of our time now is the opposite of the paradisical myth. He says back then it was a woman seduced by Lucifer passing the apple on to Adam. Now it's the Arimanic seducing the male and passing that influence on to the female. And uh, the West uh, taking in the Arimanic and through colonialism, impressing it on the East, which has a different kind of heritage. So the West is dominating history at this point. And a part of the Western brotherhoods don't want what should happen in the Slavic, Russian, 
uh, realm to emerge because it would undermine their long-term goal of remaining the great superpower. Uh, so you have secret societies that know about these three mysteries and like in the Lord of the Rings, the Dark Lord wants to have all the rings and control all of them. So uh, Ariman is after power. And so uh, this, he says that in the past, the sequence of incarnation, the feminine was more important, but in the future, the female incarnations will become more important as we're approaching a Sophian age where those feminine mysteries that have been in the background will need to come into the foreground. And the uh, next phase of human evolution is to embrace spirit self, which is a purified astral body, which prepares us to become united with the world soul. This is the feminine principle in the universe. This is the bride of Christ. This is the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven that has to do with the levity forces. In a feminine incarnation, one has a connection to the upper boundary of nature, uh, which begins with levity, begins with the etheric. The male tends to overshoot the incarnation and penetrate the mineral kingdom, and the forces of gravity tend to capture the male. And we know that behind the forces of gravity are uh, the center of the earth where electricity, magnetism, they're all related to each other. These are death forces. So the male is associated with the death mysteries, the female with the life mysteries. Life mysteries were in the foreground in the first half of evolution, the male death mysteries in the second. But uh, obviously, Rudolf Steiner brought the men and the women together in the Freemasonic Lodge. And he uh, raised women to a very high stature in his uh, first council, where Marie Steiner and Ita Wegman were selected to participate. But all these women were pushed out later on. So anthroposophy itself uh, needs to be seen in its own biography and read with in the light of these mysteries, so to speak. But anyways, there's much more to this that I'll talk about maybe next time. Yeah. In my own personal experience, I think that a bridge is beginning to be built internally. Mm. Uh, at least, I mean, I've, I've been married to a woman for 35 years, and I know how to recognize the two aspects of, of my being and reconcile them in such a positive way that I think it's a positive move towards the far distant future. That's how I experience my personal homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the important thing is that uh, people are left free. Uh, we can't have uh, this uh, regression to uh, a religion that uh, condemns uh, uh, people and looks down at them self-righteously. Uh, that's the problem with a dualistic view of good and evil. Uh, self-righteousness is a luciferic tendency uh, and that's part of what's wrong with uh, Judaism in, in many of its expressions, Islam, where the women are treated terribly, like you can see in Afghanistan right now, telling them they can't speak in public, can't show their faces, because they have a certain power over the lower nature of the men, and they'd rather not have that be out there in the public. But uh, uh, there's something wrong with, with any morality that comes and dictates from outside. And that's the danger of a kind of theocratic system like you have in uh, Iran. And you've got it in the Christian right in America right now, where they would like to bring the Ten Commandments into the school. They'd like to take certain books out of the libraries. It's all a kind of uh, going backwards at a time when freedom is the ultimate reason we're exposed to good and evil in the first place. And we need to redeem it, but it has to happen from inside at our own initiative, not somebody condemning us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank you. much.
So there is uh, a question from Richard, and I believe let's let's make it last um, question because we're working very close to. I mean, I want a couple of brief comments. Okay, mm -hmm. the difference between men and women. Okay, uh, a man where it marries a woman, he thinks she won't change. She will. A woman marries a man and thinks he will change. He won't. Okay. So that's just that's just a little comment. But now I have a question about vaccinations. Okay, and vaccinations in relation to autism. I don't know if you can answer it because this early vaccination and things like that is you know is not a good thing. And you know I just speak to my son who is an anthroposophist. He, uh, he again he doesn't go to a church or anything. He happens to have seen Jesus when he was a child. I was there. Uh, and I just told, tell him to just hold off on the vaccinations for as long as you can. Because he lives in California and there are very strict requirements. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, again, uh, this is an area where we need to think for ourselves and look at all of the evidence that's available. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, medicine uh, in its current form has good and bad karma uh, connected with it. So the materialistic tendencies in the modern scientific worldview, those have an arimonic uh, character. Rudolf Steiner spoke of if we have a strong inner spiritual life, then we can ward off uh, these kinds of infectious uh, diseases. He uh, spoke of these uh, beings, uh, these microscopic uh, illness producing beings as related to the god Mammon, which is really another name for Ariman, uh, also the god of money. Uh, Ariman uh, is very good at abstract logic, so anything having to do with numbers and adding things up like algorithms on computers, this is sort of his forte. So uh, the uh, immunization that uh, was developed uh, after this uh, recent uh, worldwide uh, pandemic, as they called it, uh, where it spread uh, from various countries, some hot spots here and there, and they did this DNA kind of uh, mimicking the part of the human genome that resists the illness. Like when they have the old school method, they would take uh, a little bit of that uh, illness producing uh, germ or uh, sickness agent, and they would uh, integrate that into the immunization. So you would develop, uh, let's say, a polio vaccine or uh, one of these illnesses. Uh, like right now, they're, they're in danger of polio in Gaza. So uh, Israel's letting them come in to uh, immunize some of the children. So some of these things are effective. And uh, I know that uh, um, the former head of the anthroposophical medical section uh, who visited Hawaii uh, numerous uh, times, uh, Michaela Gleckler, uh, she suffered from polio. And uh, uh, she, uh, you know, had then her legs uh, weren't functioning properly. She had uh, knee replacements and was able to walk uh, better. So some of these uh, miracles of technology are not to be kind of just shunned across the board. Uh, I know there are parents who are grappling with uh, what kind of immunization to allow for their children, because these are being heavily pushed uh, by the medical profession. And Steiner spoke of how 
the early childhood illnesses are the way that the soul of the child fights against the hereditary stream so that it can come to become a true individual uh, and its own features in its own body. And so uh, there are forces in the medical profession that's materialistic that work against the spirit. Steiner indicated that there would come a point where they would immunize uh, people against having spiritual thoughts. And uh, these immunization often take place when you're a little baby, so uh, you don't have much of a choice. So it's important that people penetrate these things and uh, you know discern whether it's right for them. I know a lot of old people uh, in old age home were the ones that were getting the worst of this most recent uh, contagious uh, uh, illness that spread across the globe. Whereas back in Steiner's time, after the uh, First World War, they had a major uh, outbreak in uh, Spain and all across Europe, but it attacked mainly young, healthy people. Uh, so uh, I think our time, um, uh, we need to discern these things. And I, I would agree that uh, I, I would avoid jumping at just getting all the immunations, uh, whether it's for uh, the flu uh, that are coming in the fall uh, or uh, COVID uh, and the latest variant of COVID. And I think on the political scene, left and right, there is now a sense that this has been that was overdone the last time around. And so in certain places, like in one part of New York, they have a law that you can't wear a mask. People are being arrested for wearing masks. So these are kind of crazy reactions that you get. And China closed down so heavily that it hurt their whole economy. And so these are left and right political buzz uh, themes that one has to rise above politics to discern uh, but uh, I think uh, it's, you know, each one of us has to gather what information we can and try to make the best decision, both for ourselves and our children. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, dear friends, um, okay, we close to three hours of our work, and uh, I think it's a good time to conclude. Thank you so much. Our meeting, so please uh, feel free and unmute your machines and say words of thank you to Florian. Yeah, thank, thank you, Florian. You. Looking forward to the next time. Uh, thank, thank you, Dick. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And thank you, Andre, for hosting this. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for coming. Thank you. Blessings. Blessings on everybody. Aloha from Hawaii. <laughs> Aloha, Florian. And if you ever come to visit Hawaii, you can uh, look me up over here. It's uh, not a bad place to come in the winter, especially. <laughs> Thank you, Florian. Sure. My whole family is there. Oh, okay. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.